what attracts the very best people to you is not your need for them. It is their observance of how capable and competent you have become. I say that in a way I've always said it. People will help you succeed when it becomes apparent that you are likely to succeed without their help. So you've got to help yourself. You've got to make yourself look like an investment. God cannot do that for you. You have to do what? You have to do that for yourself. Pastor, all these things you are saying, they are very nice. Is it in the Bible? Yes. 1 Timothy chapter 4 verse 14. 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 14 to 16, it says, Do not neglect your gift. Did you see that? Do not neglect your gift, which was given you through a prophetic message when the body of elders laid hands on you. Now watch this. How did you get the gift? Through the move of the Holy Spirit in a service where there was laying none of hands. So you received something definite. But if you neglect the gift, it stays only a gift. It will not manifest. So what did he tell him to do? He said, be diligent in these matters. Give yourself wholly to them so that everyone may see your progress. Many people that God has here marked to help you are waiting for your progress. You will not progress. You will not upgrade. You will not grow if you are not diligent in these matters. Are you getting this? He says, so that everybody may see your progress. Verse 16, watch your life and doctrine closely. Persevere in them. Because if you do, you will save both yourself and your hearers. Now this subject is so important to Apostle Paul that in his second letter to Timothy, he said it again. Second Timothy chapter 1 and verse 6 to 7. For this reason I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. Exclaim, are you getting this? Peaky Shakes can only say we're having a concert. Silla. Paul the Apostle is saying, I know what happened when I lay hands on you. But you are the one that can take it to the next level. You are the one that will fan it into flame. Say to your neighbor, you've got to do something about it. it. says, for God did not give us a spirit of timidity, but a spirit of power, of love, and of self-discipline. I said something in the course of the week I want to remind us. If your weakness is always the theme of your relationship, you can do something about it. When you are relating with anybody and the issue in the relationship is always your weakness, you need to understand it's your fault. Because everybody has strengths, everybody has weaknesses. What we talk about is what you project. Do you understand what I'm saying? And stop living like you need people to be merciful to you. No, you can be gracious to them. <laughs> there are two different things. Mercy is, please, treat me in a way I don't deserve. Grace is, I have a gift you don't deserve that will be stowed to you. Do you understand what I'm saying? You stop waiting for people to be merciful to you. Can I help a husband here? You did something. You got on your wife's nerves. You offended her. And you are moody. You are moody. You are moping all over the place. Expecting her to just forgive you. Yeah, it's okay for her to forgive you. But how about you take it to another level and be gracious? I like what somebody did. He did something his wife did not like. And while she was in the process of forgiving him, he bought her a brand new car. Hallelujah. He's trying to say, when you are done getting over what I did, remember who I am. I have capacity. If I can do this, there's more where that came from. Get over your issues fast. You did something at work last week, Wednesday, last week, Thursday. Your boss was angry with you. Don't stay there. Don't stew over it. Don't, no, go back to work on Monday with your A game, with your gift. I don't need mercy. I can be gracious. Say to your neighbor for me, I'm not at anybody's mercy. <laughs> Tell that person, I really don't need help. What I need is an opportunity. You know, there are two different things. I need help means that I don't have anything to offer. Just help me. No, you see, I really don't need help. See, you don't need stipends from people. You, you need a job. And when you go to work, you are not going, they are not helping you. You are the one helping them. Listen, if you work for any organization, whatever they pay you, multiply it by two. That is what the organization gets for the fact that you work there. If not, they will fire you. Let me say it again. If you work for any organization and they pay you X amount, whatever that amount is, multiply it by two. It is bad business if they are not making much more than that and they are paying you. So say to your neighbor, I'm the one helping. <laughs> Hallelujah. Think about it. I'm helping you and you are paying me a fraction of what I'm bringing to the table. 
That's why when God nudges you to start your own business, never be afraid to step out. Especially if you've been in paid employment for quite a while. By now, you should have an idea of your value. What you have earned in the last 10 years multiplied by two. Then press into the future in the next 10 years, you have an idea of what you can make happen. One HR manager told me, he said, if you leave a job and you go to another organization, he said, the minimum you should, they should employ you for is the next step. If you are a receptionist, you go to another company, they take you as a receptionist, what they are telling you is that you have not grown. If you used to be a receptionist and you go for another organization, they should make you head of receptionists. Minimum. Do you understand what I'm saying? If you were a driver, you change buses. Well, maybe you go to somebody driving a better car. Hello? I'm telling you the truth. By the way, most of the guys who are driving you right now, if you ask them very well, they are using your car to get comfortable. And they are believing God for their own. I'm telling you. You know, so I met some guys recently, and one of them told me, instead of driving somebody, I will get a car on higher purchase. It's some sharp mind. He said, I will get a car on higher purchase, and in about two, three years, I will pay up for the car. And I will sustain myself in those three years, and after that, the car is mine. You, are now, you now have that kind of person as your driver. Every time he's washing your car every day, you need to understand, it's not your car he's washing. <laughs> And I need somebody to begin to do that. Go back to work tomorrow and stop seeing yourself like an employee. Look at the whole building. Be, be, be conscious and be, care, I mean, be caring about the environment, okay? Be nice to all the people. It's my building. They are our company vehicles. This is dirt in our compound. We need to clean it. You know the reason why? Because I'm buying it up one of these days. If I don't buy this particular one, I'm going to buy something similar to this. If I don't buy something too similar to this, I will build my own from scratch. Are you getting this? So you've got to be growing. Amen? Nobody will do that for you. Hallelujah. Nobody will do that to you, for you. I told somebody recently, and it's the truth, and I'm going, to, I'm going to disillusion somebody right now. In the real sense of it, nobody can raise you. In the real sense of it, nobody can raise you. The power of mentoring is not in the mentor. The power of mentoring is in the protege. The quality of answers you get is based on the quality of questions you ask. The quality of questions is based on the quality of your thinking. The quality of your thinking is based on the quality of your study. Your mentor cannot study for you. I used to think our lecturers were wicked in those days. When they would come to class, say a few things, and they say, go to the library. I didn't get what they were trying to do. They were actually telling us the truth. That if you had gone to the library before coming to this class, I would have been unnecessary. Because everything I'm about to say, or that I know to say, is in a book that you have not read. So instead of misbelaboring the issue, go and read the book. It's not just that you will know the information. Your mental muscles will now be developed, not only to read those kind of books, but to write those kind of books. Because you grow to the level of the person you fellowship with. Did you get that now? So you don't need Papa Deboye to be your mentor. Read his books. Because when people produce works, they put their very best there. See, sometimes you need people's messages more than you need their church office. I am in his office. No, read his book. Listen to his message. And when you have opportunity to access such people, ask them questions based on the things you've been thinking about, based on their work that you have been consuming. Two things will happen. For them, it's compliment, and then they will leak. Amen? They will leak. I'm looking forward to meeting John Maxwell one-on-one. -on -one. And I want to tell him to his face, I've read everything you've ever written. But I have this question. I won't tell you my question. <laughs> see, when you tell the person, I've consumed your work, they're like, wow. But you see, if you, you don't want to study, you just want to see the person, just, just tell me, just tell me. You know, just tell me. Just tell me. If everything you know about a book is what somebody said about the book, you don't know anything about the book. Sila. If everything you know about a book is what somebody told you about the book, you don't know anything about the book. You've got to consume it for yourself. Hallelujah. Say so you've got to do what you've got to consume it.